Hello and welcome to this edition of the program, People, Politics and Power. I am Imoni Amarere. On the program today, we will focus on two separate subjects. The first shall be on the just concluded Citizens' Summit for National Integration, Peace and Security, which was convened by the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, NIPR to signpost its 2022 annual general meeting held here in the nation's capital, Abuja. The two-day summit, which had as its theme, reopened conversation, rebuilt trust, is a consequence of the widening trust gap and deficit in almost every segment, every sector, and among groups and individuals across the nation. While acknowledging that the strength of our system lies in its component units, the Institute thinks a citizen's derived solution and action is what is needed at this time to re-energize the nation, restore trust, rebuild and reconcile relationships, and mobilize citizens for deeper patriotic participation. The summit attracted participants of all categories from far and near. Well, I'm joined in the studio at this point in time uh, by the chairman of the National Planning Committee of the summit itself, Dr. Ike Neliaku, a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, who will take a look at the targets and the outcomes of the summit. Welcome, Dr. Niriako. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished Congratulations <laughs> on, on, on a very successful summit. Thank you, and congratulations to you also for emerging a fellow of the Institute. Thank you so much. By merit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so, what informed the decision, the choice, to do a citizen's summit at this point in time? Okay. Um, it started in Bauchi. Last year, we had our annual general meeting and a new council, a new governing council was elected to drive the affairs of the Institute for the next two years, as it were then. And we asked ourselves some basic questions. What do we need to do that will be different? We undertook a study, and uh, we felt that we should be scientific, since PR is a profession that is driven by scientific analysis, social engineering, and stuff like that. So we, we undertook a study, and the, the study brought out three outstanding revelations. Not that you don't see them, but it was now properly articulated. Number one, there is a widening trust gap. The trust gap may have been there, but it has continued widen and you know part of the things that widens trust gap is when nothing is done to a whole naturally it continues to expand so the trust gap continued to expand and widen over a period of time we also discovered that citizens were becoming hopeless quite a good number of citizens were becoming hopeless on their level of understanding what is going on in the country. They were no longer ready to take their country very seriously. So quite a good number of people were making arrangements to leave the country. And interestingly, you would think that it is only the young people that will be doing this, but it wasn't. We saw very respected professionals taking leave of Nigeria to go and practice elsewhere, and so on. And then number three, we discover that citizens seem to be at a loss on what to do. Meanwhile, there is so much to be done. Let me expand a little bit on the first issue, the widening trust gap. We also discover from this research, this study, that the trust gap is essentially at three levels. Number one, trust between government and the citizens. Government is there, citizens are there. Citizens are no longer trusting their governments at various levels. Local government, state government, 
federal government. So when we say government, it's not just federal, okay? At various levels, citizens were no longer trusting their governments. And we felt that this is very dangerous. More like a breakdown of the social contract. Yes. Breakdown of social contract and breakdown of social relationships. Then number two, we discovered that there is also a widening trust gap between ethnic nationalities that came together to constitute Nigeria. You mentioned in your opening statement that the component units of every federation is as important as the federation. Because once the links are delinked, then the natural tendency is that integration begins to disintegrate. So those links are very, very important in building and rebuilding the fabrics of our nationhood. So there was a loss of uh, trust among the, the ethnic nationalities. They were beginning to tolerate and manage one another Inspect, instead of respecting each other on that basis. And then we also discovered that there is a trust deficit between elders and young people. Young people, for some reasons, decided that it was time to ask the elders to go home, that they have ruined their future, they have ruined their country, they have, they have not been able to lead Nigeria the way it should be over this period of time. And the elders were saying, yes, but we have also tried some of you and you failed. And there are names of young people that took over government, you know, and they couldn't make it. So what do we do? We then came up with the understanding that it is not in this one throwing us passions on the other, but rather let us engage in collaborative relationship. Let the elders recognize the vibrancy, the energy, and the creativity of the young ones and give them the opportunity to show leadership. Let the young ones also realize that they need the experience and the network of elders to be able to lead and do what they want to do. So with all these things together, we felt that there is something to be done. But more importantly, Moni, we discovered that Nigerians need a credible platform that they can trust. Because the issue is trust gap. Mm. They need a credible platform that they can trust. We volunteered ourselves. The NIPR, by reason of the law that set us up, gives us the mandate to make laws that will govern the practice and the profession of public relations in the country. And public relations is about building goodwill, enhancing understanding, managing and building relationships, you know, ensuring that things are done properly. And one of the, the basic belts of doing this is something as simple as stakeholder engagement, stakeholder identification. Once you know this principle as a professional, nothing goes wrong in a society where stakeholders are properly managed. It's one of the elementary courses that we are taught mm. in public relations, stakeholder engagement. You must identify the stakeholders in every situation and engage them professionally in a way that they feel that they are part and parcel of the process. So when we identified all these things, we knew that our job was clearly cut out for us. Do I go on? Yeah, of, of course. <laughs> I, I, I recognize that at this summit, you yeah. did bring together all the critical stakeholders in the Nigerian project yeah. to the table. Yeah. Uh, very robust discussions. Thank you. Uh, different sections, plenary, and then, of course, uh, syndicates. Sy syndicate sessions and, and all of that. Now, the point is, how are, is the NIPR hoping to translate what has happened at this summit to the larger Nigerian society in helping to rebuild hope, in helping to re-energize Nigerians and, and helping to build a more united country. Yeah. You know, we thought through this very, very carefully and very, very well. Page 40 of 
the summit brochure clearly stipulates that there must be robust post-summit activities, beginning with drafting a report of the summit. And we said it's not going to be one of those things that you just do, uh, issue, communicate, and go home. We, we have a robust draft report, report drafting committee led by a distinguished Nigerian professor, Haruna, who was uh, uh, the former vice chancellor of Federal University, Gashua, a profound mind. He's the one leading a team of other professionals and professors to work on this report. And they have three good months to do this. Why? Because a lot has been collected from the report from the summit, right from when we had zonal uh, summits at the six geopolitical zones and the seventh zone, that is diaspora. We took the diaspora as the seventh zone. So there were zonal oh, yes. summits that culminated in this exactly. last major national yes. summit. That yeah. was part of what helped us in building the consensus mm. and the stakeholder engagement. We had the Northwest Zonal Summit in Kanu on the 14th of October. We moved to the south-south in Port Harcourt, and we had it on the 4th of November. We proceeded to Gombe for northeast, and we had it on the, no, before Gombe, it was just on the 16th of November, Gombe for northeast. On the 18th of November, Enugu for southeast. On the 30th of November, Lagos for southwest. southwest. On the 2nd of December, and then we now did the seventh zone and that is the diaspora, on the 19th of June this year. And we collected all the thoughts. That was how we arrived at the 14 syndicates. The thematic things we used for the syndicate came from excerpts of these zonal uh, uh, engagements, plus the five plenary topics that were used. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, we made sure that the views collected from the zonal dialogues were built into the main summit for more Nigerians to now come across the Federation. It's no longer enough for you from the South-South to share your own views. We wanted the man from Northwest to engage in discussing the outcome of what happened at the zonal level in the South-South. So that was why we had to bring everything to the fore and to say, look, let us now discuss it. And it was robustly debated across 14 syndicates for two days. And at the end of the day, we are now handing over everything to this committee for them to do a thorough work. After they have come up with a draft on the, in three months' time, we will now go back. We will share this draft among the executive because a, a number of government agencies participated. And I want to really thank uh, government for understanding what we are trying to do and allowing us to do that without misunderstanding us. You know, when we talk about stakeholder engagement, we don't understand the weight of it. We went and submitted ourselves to government. We took ourselves to DSS. We took ourselves to NIA. We took ourselves to the office of the SGF. We took ourselves to all these places. Why? So that they will understand what we are doing not for somebody to go and misrepresent us and say what we are not doing. We say, look, this is who we are, and this is what we want to do. And we want you to support us, because we are doing it for the sake of the nation. And in fairness to them, they understood and gave us their blessing and said, go ahead. We now went to the ethnic nationalities. We did the same thing. Say, so don't think that we are doing this for government. No, it's about you. Tell us your issues. They did. When we went to see, I'll come back to your question, but I feel that some of these fundamentals are important. They are important, you know? yes. When we went to see Pa, pa Adebanjo, Ayo Adebanjo, in his house in Lagos, we thought that he was going to, you know, the way he has taken these issues. But we had a very, very robust engagement. At the end of it, he told us, you think, he said, you think you are more Nigerian than myself. Let me tell you. Then he began to tell us his own experiences 
And he said, I love Nigeria. I am a stakeholder in this country. And I have paid my price in this country. But I want to see Nigeria work while I'm still alive. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. He said, so we're on the same. He said, yes. Go ahead, my children. Anytime you need me, I will be there for you. We went and saw by Edwin Clark of Pandef. And we said, sir, this is what we want to do. He said, where have you been since? You now am a member of your institute. I was a, a, a federal commissioner for information. He said, go ahead. We went to see Chief Aldobe, chairman of Ariwa Consultancy Forum. And we said, this is what we want to do. And he said, good gracious. Please go ahead. He narrated his own thoughts and the experiences. That's why you saw that he was one of our keynote speakers. We went and met with Middle Belt Forum. We met with Ohaneze. We met with all this. And then we went to the youths. We met with the youths. What is the issue? Let us build our country. We went to women. We went to traditional rulers. We went to the clergy. We went round for about nine months just engaging. So we are going back to them again with the draft report mm. to say that, look, this assignment that we took upon ourselves, this is how far we have gone. This is the draft report. Please go through it and make input. We'll expect the executive to make input. We'll expect the judiciary to make input. We'll expect the Nigerian Governance Forum to make input. We'll expect the, the local government, uh, Algon, to make input. Then we will now go to all the other stakeholders and say, make input. Let it be a citizen's project. By the time they make input, make input on the report, make input on the draft citizen's charter that we are bringing out based on national reconciliation, national integration, and development. By the time they finish, we come back to now collect all these things and then refine the reports and then come out with a final report. Once the final report is submitted, the next stage is to inaugurate implementation committee. We want to have a committee that will implement these outcomes because our report is driven by implementation things, not theory. Uh -uh. We said it must be solution driven, it must be sustainable, and it must be implementable for a period of 10 years in the first instance, and then we can review. 10 years. Don't go and give us something that uh, you expect us to do within four, four months. It won't work because even the process alone has taken us one year to come to where we are today. One full year plus, one year plus. So by the time that is ready, we now begin to implement the outcome. And again, we are going to be robust in building the team that will handle the implementation. And it will be at the three core levels, local government, state, and federal. There are some that we can immediately do with our partners, the 75 partners working with us. Let me give you an example. Hopelessness, as challenging as it could be, can be converted when the mindset is renewed. And that's where the National Orientation Agency comes in. They are one of our partners, and we need to support them, advocate for them to be, to be better funded so that they can take up this responsibility. The NOA has structure right down to the local government areas, in some cases at the world level. It's one huge investment and asset that the nation has not taken advantage of. So we are making them part of our core allies to support them and back them up so that we can use that umbrella to begin to rebuild the mindset of Nigerians towards loving Nigeria. You can't hate something and you expect what you have hated to turn around and bless you. Mm. It doesn't the, happen. The, in, in other words, I mean, the outcome of this summit, the recommendations, the draft report that we were expecting, is not um, administration specific. G uh, given the fact that we're just about six months away to the next general elections. It will transcend this administration and perhaps uh, any other administration after that. Yes, and you see, we, we also took steps ahead of that. We invited 
the candidates of the leading political parties to attend the summit. We also are, are invited their, their leaders, the chairman and so on. But I'm not sure they turned up. You know, the political class really, really are part of the problems we have in this country. Because sometimes you don't understand what their priorities are. Mm. You know? So we invited them to come so that we can begin now to work ahead. Because one way or the other, something would happen, a new leadership will emerge, directly or indirectly. And we need them to know what we are doing so that implementation does not become a problem. They missed that opportunity. They lost it. However, we will still continue to engage. But it is something that we believe is important. That's why we said it is 10 years. So if you, even the, the, the next administration, whatever, whoever is going to be, you will see that it will outlive him or her, as the case may be, and then we continue. And after the 10 years, if we are not satisfied, we will continue until we get it right. Imoni, one of the things we observed, we are very fond of talking about New Nigeria. I grew up here in New Nigeria. <laughs> but we have been missing a very important segment of New Nigeria. New Nigeria will not emerge by just miracle or magic. You need the building blocks that will build the new Nigeria. We have not been investing in raising those building blocks. And that's part of what we want to do. If you look at our target outcome, we said we want to use this process to raise the new Nigerians that will build the new Nigeria. Unless you raise the new Nigerians that believe in Nigeria, that are prepared to work for Nigeria based on transparency, based on accountability, based on believability, based on even knowledge, having understanding and knowledge on the, on the, on the, on the way nationhood. Nationhood is a statecraft. And you must know how to craft a state. You, you listened to uh, Larry Thompson when he was talking about, about um, Wazobia dot two. And he told us, which is what some of us have talked about before. Nigeria is a programmed state. And like every other program, you need to find out what was programmed into your existence. And for some of us who have studied nationhood over time, we know that Nigeria was not programmed to succeed as a nation. We were programmed not to also fail as a nation. And that's why our own is very difficult. When you are programmed not to succeed and programmed not to fail, it means that you are programmed to keep falling without failing. So you keep running into problems. You resolve it today, you think you are moving forward, and then you fall again. You get up because that's the way you have been programmed. And there are so many things that account for this programming. You now have to deprogram and reprogram so that you can have a new Nigeria, but you need the new Nigerians that will give birth to this new Nigeria. And that's part of what we are beginning to do. So looking at all that has happened and all that we have done, I mean, when I say you, I'm talking about the NIPR, Nansan Institute. How is it going to go move this whole process forward? Because I heard during the course of the conference that the report of this conference will be submitted to the National Assembly. Hopefully, National Assembly, uh, if, if the report is ready before this current assembly uh, knocks off and taken up by the next National Assembly and the next National Assembly, uh, and hopefully in the next 10 years, there will be a, a continuous process. Yeah, part of it, I talked about the executive, I talked about the legislature, that's National Assembly, mm, mm. But legislature at state and federal, I talked about the governors as well. Because you see, there are some aspects that may require new legislation or amendment to existing legislation for certain things to, to be help. done. Yeah. There are some that we can do on our own with our coalition. 
things that the structures are already there. It is for us to lend our professional expertise so that these things are done. But the important thing is to sharpen it. For instance, education in Nigeria. All the legislations we need for education are already there. It is to now see how we can engage. What kind of curriculum or what do we need to introduce to our educational curriculum that would make our education more vibrant and more relevant to our domestic affairs? Is studying cockroach and all the elements of cockroach what we need in biology? Or do we need to study something else? Because some of these things were handed over to us based on curriculum or curricula that we inherited over time. When do we begin to teach about nationhood? Should it be from primary school? Should it even be from, from kindergarten? And what should be the content of teaching these people, these young ones, so that as they grow up, they begin to wear Nigeria as a clothes and then begin to see Nigeria. And then how do we make Nigeria to be willing to stand for Nigerians so that Nigerians will die, will be willing, rather, will be willing to die for Nigeria? Because these things come from somewhere. If you don't make somebody to see the relevance that you have for them, you don't expect him to respect you. We need to come to a point that Nigerians will respect Nigeria. They will be happy. When we, we were at um, the last Commonwealth game, you saw how Nigeria stood tall and Nigerians were happy. That is from one segment. How do we multiply this in many other segments? Mm. Imoni, I can tell you, there are many Nigerians who desire to make Nigeria proud, but they need the opportunity. So there are some that we can do within the, the membership of the coalition. There are some that will have to go to federal government and beg them and say, please, this is in the best interest of the nation. Please allow this to be done. Support us to do this, and so on and so forth. One of the things that I see emerging from this is that, sincerely, Nigeria can be turned around through exceptional leadership paradigm. Mm and it can be achieved. Dr. Iken Eliaku, I'm very sure that the NIPR has set this ball rolling and it will not stop until we get to the By final the grace of stop. God. Thank you so and much. And we want to use this opportunity to thank the AIT. The AIT has been very, very supportive right from the time we came to see your group managing director last year, August, and to say this is what we want to do. And we cannot go far unless we have the support of the media. And he said it is given. So long as it is in the best interest of this country, which is what all of us are aspiring for. He said, I have children. I don't know how many more years I will live, but I have my children, and I will have my grandchildren, and so on. I want them to have a nation they are proud of. So NIPR, we will partner with you. And they have been doing that for us. And I want to really appreciate the leadership of AIT for giving us this support. Thank you so much. Dr. Ike Neliaku, a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations and chairman of the planning committee of the Citizens Summit on Nigeria's security uh, uh, development and, of course, uh, integration, peace, uh, that just ended in the nation's capital, Abuja. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are using this opportunity to also call on other organizations who want to partner with us. Mm. The partnership is still open. It's Great. not closed. Great. Just indicate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we'll take a short break. And when we return, uh, we'll have our second discussion. And it will center on the Donkey Export and Killing Prohibition Bill 2019. Stay with us. It's people, politics, and power. In 2019, a bill known as the Donkey Export and Killing Prohibition Bill was introduced in Nigeria's National Assembly. The proposed law has so far gone through almost the entire gamut of lawmaking. 
It has undergone the rigors of first, second, and third readings in both chambers of the National Assembly, including a public hearing which took place in July this year. The bill, if and when passed and signed into law, prohibits the killing by any means and the export of a donkey, its carcass, its body parts, or any derivatives thereof out of Nigeria. The sponsors of the bill say it is aimed at mitigating the extinction of donkeys because of their depleting numbers and to protect their aesthetic, ecological, educational, historical, and recreational as well as scientific value. They also say that the use of donkeys in rural transportation is key. The B, which is in seven sections, provides in section four a penalty of 10 years imprisonment for anyone, leader or head of a corporate body or association that violates the provisions of the bill without an option of a fine. In addition, a convicted violator shall forfeit all such tools, including vehicles, vessels, structures, and devices used in connection with the slaughtering, killing, or export of a donkey to the federal government of Nigeria. However, a group known as Donkey Traders Association of Nigeria is up in arms against the passage of the bill, as according to it, it would negatively impact their businesses and means of livelihoods. The association is particularly opposed to the blanket ban on the killing of donkeys. Instead, it wants the government to come up with a policy that will encourage the breeding and rearing of donkeys, just like it is done with other livestock, such as cows. The group insists that there are investors on the ready for the breeding of donkeys that would also create jobs and create wealth for Nigerians. I'm joined in the studio by the national chairman of the Donkey Traders Association of Nigeria, Mr. D.K. Ifain. Thank you so much, Mr. Ifain, for joining us. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Amariri. Great. So, what is it that you find objectionable, that is your association finds objectionable about this uh, bill, this prohibition, donkey killing and export prohibition bill? Yes, thank you. First and foremost, uh, I'm the national chairman of the Donkey Dealers, Dealers Association of Nigeria. And uh, to go straight to your point, this is a business that has come into existence for more than centuries ago. And it has formed part of the food culture of uh, some regions, some uh, geopolitical regions in Nigeria, to go to the south-south, go to the southeast and southwest. If you go to uh, an open market in Onitsha, where the dry meat are being sold, you can, you can imagine by yourself, all those things are verifiable, the number of people that are there. But the major problem we have now is as a result of uh, smugglers, the Chinese, in collaboration, a kind of syndicate with some unpatriotic Nigerians who are head-bent on uh, frustrating the effort why we oppose the donkey bill or prohibition of killing of donkey is that it's going to affect our business. We are the stakeholders. And donkey is not a wild animal, it's a domesticated animal. If you take some scientific, uh, uh, if you take some scientific research, the gestation period of a donkey and cows is almost the same, a difference of some, some weeks. And we are slaughtering more than 50,000 cows to 60 every day. And cows have not gone into extinction. So we, the morbid fear of donkey going into extinction or the issue of using it for labor and all the rest of them is 
arising as a result of this Chinese syndicate who are headbent on smuggling. You know, these smugglers are not known. They are not investors. They can be in one hotel and they transfer 20 containers because they have nothing to lose. And at the moment, the government is going to keep a blind eye to this syndicate. Definitely, they are indirectly encouraging smugglers because the smugglers want it to be banned. And if it is banned, they have their way of getting it because they are smugglers. And a lot of our members have invested heavily. This is uh, the donkey business in Nigeria worth more than 60 billion naira. Annually? Yes, sir. More than 60 billion naira. And the people that are engaged, directly involved in the dealing of this business is more than 500,000. If you go from Gombe, Katungo local, go Katungo local government, you go to Adamawa, you go to Kebi, that is Yawuri and Zuru, you come to Marabeda, you go to Obala for Inenugu, you go to Abakliki, Izambo, you go to Abo, you go to, uh, what do they call it, uh, Jigawa, you find out a lot of uh, donkey slaughterhouses. And you will see the level of uh, investment. At the, and you will see the level of the, the micro, micro business that is going on within that locality. Because a lot of people, it, is, it has a, the economic value chain of donkey is, is inexhaustible from the point of buying it till it gets to the final consumer. So we are totally against it because I think, we think that the best thing the government should do for us is to protect our business Regulate. We are talking about regulation. Regulation, sir, is all about control. Let the government have a systematic control where it is going to engage people who are having their means of livelihood from there, encourage investors who, are in, who have invested, and even bring more investors. Because one of the problem of uh, one of the problem we are facing in this country is our policy execution. The, most times we don't have a proper uh, pragmatic uh, policy and is making is giving the kind of impression to investors that they are not safe so if this policy if this bill continues to gather momentum definitely it is going to kill down 50 billion naira investment and is going to increase unemployment i'm talking about four, four, more than 2 to 3 million people and you know the security situation. You, so you, you, you just talked now about uh, the, the possibility of this animal going into extinction, which is the fear being addressed by this bill. Do we know for certain the population of donkeys we have in Nigeria today? Okay. Um, I think uh, the, the livestock, uh, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Livestock, if they have taken their data, we, we, in Nigeria we don't even have more much because most of these donkeys that are slaughtered come from neighboring countries like Niger, Chad, Cameroon, um, Burkina Faso and all the rest of them. They, so they, are, they are not even bred in Nigeria. They are not bred in Nigeria. So we are we we are, as we are talk we are saying because we have started the breeding. The farms are there. You can verify. You can go to and see the farms. We have started the pastures some of our members before this bill uh, comes up. So if we are talking about the, uh, the extinction of donkey in Nigeria, Nigeria, we don't even have, a, we don't even have a donkey in commercial quantity. But if we are going to have a proper regulation, Nigeria stands a better opportunity to be a donkey hub in the whole world because the surrounding, the neighboring countries like Niger and Chad, based on their faith, they don't eat it. They don't have anything to do with it. In South Africa in 1952, when people have not started harvesting donkey, donkey turned out to be a problem to crop farmers because the population increased without stopping. They begin to consume and destroy crop farming. And the government have to come up with uh, uh, destructive means of spending billions of dollars of naira to begin to kill those donkeys. So when this ban is finally has gone into law, definitely we are going to experience what the South African experience. And if government is going to go into regulation, which the Nigerian Agricultural Quarantine Service is doing, they have done it. Some months ago, they started arresting some of these uh, Chinese who are involved in smuggling. 
And immediately this action started, we saw a very drastic halt in smuggling. And people were comfortable doing their business. So if they allow these Chinese to continue again, they are going to have, um, they will multiply because it's a crime syndicate. So, so Mr. Efrain, isn't that what one of the things that this bill seeks to address, to halt the activities of these Chinese and maybe other foreign smugglers who take the uh, the carcass, the derivatives from from uh, donkeys and export to their countries or to other parts of the world? Because this bill says prohibition of killing and export. export. Is it just the killing that your association is concerned with, or is both the killing and the export? Um, the, the killing and the export, they go hand in hand. Because the meat from this donkey is locally consumed. And the hides of this donkey always come out once a donkey is slaughtered. So if you, can, if you take a policy that we put a blanket ban on killing of donkey, invariably, you have shut down the people that are eating this donkey as their meat. Because if you go to the market, some people, like in Abakaliki, when you want to get married, you present a donkey to them as a gift. The, it has come to that level of cultural uh, as assimilation within their side. And it is an alternative to beef. So because these Chinese have turned to be a problem, we don't, throw a, uh, we don't throw away a, 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 a bad child with the, well, bad, uh, bad water. We have to strike and see how we are going to form a policy that will stop smuggling, encourage local content, encourage breeding, regulation. This control will work. But if because of the Chinese, can we because of the Chinese, if the Chinese comes and begin to export our cocoa yam, because it has some medicinal value or it will attract some business interest in their own area. Sir, so, uh, do you think the best thing we are going to do is to short farming or eating of cocoa yam instead of seeing a way to remove this syndicate from the system? So what we are saying is that we should separate the chips from the sharp. These smugglers, we are against them. Let the government go after them because these businesses have been existing before the coming of the Chinese. And we cannot because of these Chinese. People have invested and we have lost it. So let the government empower, support the Nigerian agricultural paradigm for their certification of agricultural produce and know how best they are going to give a framework. They have a very robust uh, a regulatory work. Like it, it is done in Kenya. So in Pakistan... And, and, and this law, this uh, piece of legislation that is uh, under consideration now, do not, does it in any way uh, give room for a role to be played by the Nigerian quarantine, Agricultural Quarantine Service that you talk about. Thank you, sir. That, of course, the Nigerian Agricultural Quarantine Service is like the police of the, Agri the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm. Uh, it, it, I was in Tanzania, I was in Dar es Salaam, and I had some discussion with the Ministry of Livestock. They said that they don't have much to do. It is the quarantine that they are under the quarantine. So for you to export crop, animal, and plant, have to go through the certification. So it is the duty of this quarantine, one, to know who and who is involved in whatever or what agricultural produce and where is going and the certification of whoever that is involved. Because through this, they will identify the stakeholders. The government is going to end because the, those companies are going to pay their taxes. They are going to employ people. They are going to pay those people. So. Th that is where the agricultural, Nigerian Agricultural Quarantine Service comes in. But without the Nigerian Agricultural Quarantine Service, definitely it is Uhuru for these smugglers. Mm. Now, this um, bill, there was a public hearing held on it in July. Yes, sir. Was your association at that public hearing? Did you present this case the way you are presenting it now? And what was the response? Thank you. Uh, in 2017, let me start from 2017. I was in the House of Rep on the public hearing, headed by right, um, uh, Mungunu, Honorable Mungunu, who was the chairman of House Committee on Agriculture. And we presented our memo, our memo, our memorandum. We gave it to them. We told them that this is going to be anti, uh, is going to have counterproductive pro, pro, value because the essence of giving a blanket ban 
on this is indirectly encouraging smugglers. These smugglers can do their business in the middle of the night. They can do it in Sambesa Forest. They can do it anywhere. They are not known. But once it is regulated, this regulation is going to remove, is going to put these smugglers away, and the real investors are the people, the locals, both the farmers, both the people that are heading it, the people that are slaughtering it, the people that are removing the skin, even the bone, the blood, and all the rest of them. Because from the point of purchase to the final point, it has about 17 to 18 segments, and all these things are the economic value chain. As it goes, people are benefiting from it. When uh, the former governor of uh, uh, Sokoto State, Wamako, the former governor, one time he visited the donkey uh, market, and he was so impressed. He said, when I was coming, I saw people, Okada was moving, people are selling cards, people are selling food, and he gave them 10 million for them to increase what they are doing, because he can see that they are engaged. So what we are talking is that let the government support the Nigerian Agricultural Parentime Regulatory Framework. That is the first thing that they will do, so that it is going to give the investors the mind for them to, because most of them borrowed money from banks for them to invest, because it's, it's not a business you invest this year and end this year. You can invest it this year, and in the next four years, you begin to harvest. So it's a long-term business, and it's capital intensive. Mm. So the Nigerian Agricultural Parentime should be at the head to super, uh, supervise, and which they have been doing. They did it some months ago. So when we went to the Senate, the public hearing on July, I also made the presentation, and this is my memo, I have a copy of it, before them, and we told them, if you watch, the, the president of this country said he wants to see every Nigerian sleeping with the two eyes closed. And I was giving them a scenario where about one to two million people will be disengaged from their source of livelihood. And these people have been people who have been handling knife, uh, killing of all these things. It is going to, it's vulnerable for our security situation, one. Number two, we are not going to attract the foreign exchange that we are beckoning for. If you go to Pakistan, they have built two donkey farms. And they are the first in the world to build a donkey clinic. And they've signed a contract of $13.5 billion on the exportation of donkey derivatives. And this is an economic advantage to their country. So Nigeria should tap, even if we are going to tap 1% out of what is good, because it is a juicy business that is going to it, 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 that is going to increase the, the internal generated revenue. So I'm talking about billions. We need to take a statistics of the volume of fund that is transacted into this business. So it is not something that we have to evaluate. Is your association considering, for instance, ranching as a, an alternative as part of the breeding process, mm. ranching of donkeys? Uh, because I think that one of the things that is bothering a lot of Nigerians today is the uh, uncoordinated manner in which cows are bred and transported from one part of the country to the other. You know very well the kind of uh, headers, farmers, farmers crisis slash, that has. So, so as to avoid a similar occurrence, is your association considering the ranching? Let's have ranches in different parts of the country where uh, 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 donkeys can be bred. Yes, uh, that is what I, I have told you before. If you, we have we have uh, members who are into ranching because the first thing we did, since they are having the morbid fear that donkey will go into extinction, mm. we came up with our own that we can multiply five million donkeys if given the enabling environment within a space of six seven years, because we have signed. Some of our, our mem uh, stakeholders have signed a memorandum of understanding with National Animal Production Research Institute, Amadebelo University, Shikazaria. They are saddled with the responsibility of the scientific uh, production of donkeys. They know it, even insemination, uh, scientific insemination on donkey and all the rest of them. So we have signed with them because we know if we can increase the population of donkey, the fear, that morbid fear that donkey will go into extinction will no longer be there. We started by pasture because, first of all, the problem of farmers' headers issue is as a result of the, 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 the animals we are looking for grass to eat. So for you to introduce an animal, for you to breed or for you to ranch, you have to have the pasture. 
You can get the animal, but the pasture have to be grown. So once you introduce the animal, they will feed on their own, go back to the other thing, and begin to multiply on their own. It's not a rocket science. It's a very simple thing that we can do with a very calculated, with a very consistent policy. And there is no way that we are going to have a better atmosphere like Pakistan and Kenya are getting from it, even Ethiopia here. If the Nigerian Agricultural Quarantine Service do not regulate and control, especially to stamp out these smugglers, because it's as a result of them that we are having this issue. So I lectured in China from 2001 to 2007. I lectured in Osho University, Qingdao, and I lectured in Nankai University, Tianjin. So within my time of there, within my time of being there, I speak Chinese, I speak the uh, Mandarin. Within my time of being there, their policy is sacrosanct. Their law, you don't go near it. But it surprises me that when they come over here, they are having some aids. Some people are padding them, go and break the law and you do this. You can't do it in China. Mm. Well, so in, in other words, uh, and on a final note, if this law, if this B passes this entire process of lawmaking and gets to the president and he uh, eventually signs it into law, that will have, in your estimation, social and economic impact on Nigerians. Now, what you are asking for, what you are seeking, is a policy framework different from this law mm. that will actually encourage you to breed, to rear, and to trade on donkey. In, in, in donkey business. Yes. I, I think the president is a farmer. I think the president is a farmer, and he will encourage farming. So the president, we are informing, we are calling upon the president, the Senate, and the necessary agency that the best option is for them to support the breeding, ranching, and the regulation of the donkey business, and to empower the Nigerian Agricultural Quarantine Service to do their job, the certification for exportation. And whoever, the stakeholders should be protected. All we are doing is to protect the investment of our members. So you, somebody has built a factory at uh, Anambra. That factory is, is more than, uh, so that factory is more than two billion on donkey. With every class A standard. And once this bill finds its way to be signed, so we are talking about more than 60 billion mm. will be lost. So is, is there, what is the association doing in terms of lobbying the lawmakers? Yes, sir. Um, we are trying our best. In, we are trying our best uh, considering the Nigerian situation, the Nigerian factor. We are trying our best to reach so, to some of our lawmakers because we have been able to, we have been able to pass through them. We have seen them in the, in the public hearing. They've had our own opinion. Uh, we have gone to the media where they've had our own opinion, but we are still moving internally, doing a kind of uh, mosquito lobbying. Please let them reason with us, because I think good reason give way for better ones. So the, 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 the law may have a good intention, but I think the regulation and the breeding and the ranching is a better formula that is going to stamp out and get what Nigeria is looking at in nips of time. Thank you so much, Mr. D.K. Fahy. He's the national chairman of Donkey Dealers. Dealers Association of Nigeria. Thank you for your time. You're welcome.